Welcome back, Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed in the first trailer for Spider-Man No Way Home. Finally, after months of waiting and rumors, we finally have our trailer. Now, this has huge repercussions for the MCU, the multiverse, and believe it or not, this trailer actually signals the end of Spider-Man's time in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I'll explain how a little later in the video. The trailer begins with Peter and MJ on the roof. Now, she obviously doesn't believe the lie that he killed Mysterio, and it seems like this whole experience has just strengthened their relationship. And Peter is now having to deal with being famous. Wait, scratch that. He's infamous. They're on a roof together, showing that Peter wants to share his world with MJ in any way that he can. And MJ is reading a newspaper article that speculates that Peter has the ability to hypnotize women. Some suggest that Parker's powers include the male spider's ability to hypnotize females. Stop, come on. <laughs> yes, my spider lord. <laughs> now this is just one way of the public thinking that Peter's kind of creepy, and who knows what he got up to when he was hiding his face from the world. Sep Spidey Talk on Twitter found a lot of Easter eggs that I missed. For instance, this graffiti behind MJ and Peter, which says Ditko honoring Steve Ditko, co-creator of Spider-Man. Now the headline reads Spider Minions, which makes me think this is a character the New York Post has drawn of Aunt May and Ned, the people who knew Peter's secret identity. This is gonna play into Peter's decision later on. So the Raimi and Webb movies did a better job of exploiting this, but people in the Marvel Universe don't like Spider-Man. He's shifty. He hides his face. He actually frightens people sometimes. That's one of the reasons why they're all so susceptible to J. Jonah Jameson's propaganda. Now, when Peter Webb slings with Mary Jane, this is the exact shot that we saw during the Far From Home mid credit scene, but now the image of J. Jonah Jameson is plastered all over Times Square, making me think this is actually some sort of nightmare sequence. Then they replay the audio of J. Jonah Jameson, revealing that he is Spider-Man. That's right, folks. Spider-Man is, in fact, Peter Parker cut to Peter defending himself to the cops. Since he's not in jail, we can assume that they don't have any physical evidence on him, or maybe lawyers from Stark Industries are at least keeping him out of jail pending charges. And maybe the lawyer that Stark Industries paid for was Matt Murdock. Then we hear, Now that everybody knows, you don't really have to hide or lie to people. As we see people protesting outside his school, you might be wondering why they're not embracing him as one of the heroes of Avengers Endgame. Well, remember, they think that he was a murderer who stole Tony Stark's legacy. And then his classmates clamor around, and Peter's not enjoying the attention. Remember, he was never that popular. Sub penis, Parker! And now he's just a creepy murderer kid who goes out at night wearing a mask. And you'll notice here in the hallway, we see Betty doing the TV newscast. Gee, I wonder what her top story is. Then we see Peter and MJ on the Queensboro Bridge, which was the setting for the climax of Spider-Man 1. This could be an example of the multiverse twisting and collapsing on itself, as we'll see later on. But of course, Peter, being the selfless guy that he is, is more worried about the people in his life. We see him and Aunt May watching J. Jonah Jameson on TV. Now remember, in the Far From Home post credit scene, he was still just from the DailyBugle.com. Now, he's ridden this wave of Spider-Man hatred into a successful television career. Now, who are they looking at here? My personal theory, this is another Peter Parker, either Andrew Garfield or Tobey Maguire, and they're holding that reveal for another trailer. It's hard to think of anyone who would surprise them as much as another person dressed as Spider-Man. So, all of this establishes the stakes, that Peter will do anything to right these wrongs. Next, he visits the Sanctum Sanctorum of Doctor Strange to ask for help. Now, he's done this for years in the comics, basically any time he faced a mystical threat and needed a guide. But more importantly, he needed magic help to undo the world knowing his secret identity in the comics. Way back in 2006, in the comic Civil War, Peter joined Team Iron Man and was forced to reveal his secret identity to the world. It was a very, very big deal. Then his Aunt May was shot and Peter made a deal with Mephisto. Not the beast! to save her, and Pete ended up going to Doctor Strange for help straightening everything out. Now, I hate to go down this road again, but there is another possible Mephisto hint. The protest sign here. Yes, Devil in Disguise. In the storyline One More Day, it was Mephisto and not Doctor Strange who erased everyone's memory of Peter Parker. But then, of course, something went wrong. During an event called Spider Island, everyone in Manhattan got spider powers, so Peter allowed himself to be seen web-slinging in public. This broke Strange's spell and made people capable of discovering Peter's real identity once again. And we're seeing something similar play out here. Remember the first time they met? I'm Peter, by the way. 
Doctor Strange. Oh, you're using your made-up names. And now Peter is trying to observe this formality. I'm sorry to bother you, sir. Please, we saved half the universe together. I think we're beyond you calling me, sir. Strange mentions that they saved half the universe together, which got me thinking. One really cool thing that Endgame did was give everyone the chance to meet each other. Now, as Guardians know Wakandans, Peter knows the Ravagers, it makes it much harder for everyone to cross over down the road. So why is the Sanctum Sanctorum covered in snow? Did they not patch the roof after Banner crashed through it? Or is this some kind of spell going wrong, foreshadowing what's about to happen? Then we see Peter wearing his black and gold suit. Now, some people have theorized that Strange has given this to him to help stabilize the multiversal effects. Now, you see that he's moving through a homeless shelter like we saw in Far From Home. More importantly, we see here the shelter is actually called Feast, the name of the same homeless shelter that Aunt May volunteered at in the Spider-Man video games. In the comics, Peter built his black and gold suit after temporarily losing his spider sense. He needed stronger armor because he could no longer dodge bullets, and he had to reteach himself how to fight. Then we see the aftermath of Peter's identity reveal, people mobbing him. The movie could actually start just seconds after the last one ended. So then Wong enters and tells him not to cast the spell. And this is very interesting. I mean, do we actually know if Doctor Strange is technically the Sorcerer Supreme yet? Because he's still acting very irresponsibly, like he did when he was lifting books from Wong at the Karmartage Library. This movie could not only be setting up the story of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, but it could also be showing us Steven's arc and character growth. Now notice Strange's mug says, oh for Fox's sake maybe a nod to Disney buying Fox and the film rights to the X-Men. And then Wong goes on vacation, maybe so he can appear in Shang-Chi. And of course, he ignores Wong, probably because he's curious to see if he can pull the spell off. So to cast the spell, he uses one of Peter's hairs, just like he did for Thor in Ragnarok. But then Peter gets that monkey's paw, genie wish backfire scenario. He learns that he wasn't specific enough about what he wanted. So MJ's gonna forget about everything we've ever been through? Stop tampering with the spell. Oh my god, Ned, he's my best friend. Oh, my Aunt May should really know. This causes the multiverse to fracture. Now, it should be noted that had the events of Loki not occurred, then the TVA probably just would have stepped in here and kept all of this from happening. Oh, see, you broke time and you thought you could just stick it back together with this? So as a result, time and the multiverse become fractured and Peter's life spills into other universes. Notice that this frame is one that we saw in the vision that the Ancient Ones showed Doctor Strange. Now we did a whole breakdown video where I theorized that this was Strange journeying into cosmic entropy and a gateway between different universes because then he breaks down into his multiple selves. Guess I was right. This is then followed by the tunnels of light like we saw when both Strange and Loki saw visions of the multiverse like we broke down in this video. It's a really good one, you should check it out. Then we get this awesome chase sequence with the mirror dimension splitting open like we saw in Doctor Strange. Now there are lots of villain teases in this trailer that are going to lead into the Sinister Six. If you're not familiar, that's a group of Spider-Man villains united against him all the way back in Amazing Spider-Man Annual 1 and recently in the Sony Spider-Man video game. Stay out. So here's some of the villain teases. We see yellow electric bolts flashing above the police, signaling the return of Jamie Foxx's Electro, but a slightly different Electro. This one's electricity is yellow, like in the comics, and it was blue in Amazing Spider-Man 2. Now this seems like a small detail, but it's actually huge. It's a way of saying that this Electro can be different. I wasn't a big fan of Jamie Foxx's take on the character, so I'm looking forward to seeing him playing it a little bit differently. And I will be like a god to them. A god named Sparkles? There's also a news van for the Daily Bugle here, again showing its rise in popularity. Now, I think this whole sequence of Peter on the train is Doctor Strange teaching Peter about the multiverse. You'll notice they even loop around and form several different timelines, just like the metaphor for the different timelines within the sacred timeline that we saw in Loki. So, when the Ancient One originally showed Strange other dimensions, she said, Who are you in this vast multiverse? meaning that all of these messed up dimensions are part of the multiverse and that there is an endless amount of universes to explore. This is why they know so little about the multiverse. The timelines created in Loki are also part of the multiverse. They're just closer to the main MCU timeline because they're governed by the same rules of laws and physics. So what I think all of this means is that Peter has split himself in two. He's now living as both Spider-Man and Peter Parker by using this device that I'm betting that he lifted from Doctor Strange. And then we 
sea strange separating his two selves, like the ancient one did to both him and to Banner, and just like Strange did to Peter in this comic. Thanks Spidey Talk on Twitter for that one. Now this sand is a clear indication that the Sinister Six villain, the Sandman's going to make an appearance, but I'm not sure if he'll actually be the Sandman from the Sam Raimi multiverse. In Spider-Man 3, which by the way is way better than you remember, the movie ends with him apologizing to Peter and then kind of blowing away. Sort of like in the comics, where he becomes a hero and an Avenger before Breaking Bad again. Now when Peter is exploring the Sanctum Sanctorum, this happens. <laughs> And that is the Lizard, a great Spider-Man villain who was kind of terrible in Amazing Spider-Man. It took away what made his character great in the comics, his wife and son, and threw that all out the window to give him some connection to Peter's dad. Again, I'm hoping that they keep the parts that work and throw away what doesn't. We get a brief glimpse of Happy Hogan watching in horror as the police close in on someone, maybe Peter. And the most fun tease, a pumpkin bomb. Be careful what you wish for, Parker. Now what's brilliant is that this could be Willem Dafoe, one of the other goblins, or a new actor who's playing the character from another universe. See, one great thing about the multiverse is that you really don't have to follow as many rules. This could literally not get any weirder. It can get weirder. Filmmakers are free to pick and choose any characters they want or recast new ones. We're actually seeing this play out at Warner Brothers, where Todd Phillips felt like he had the freedom to make whatever kind of Joker movie he wanted without tying it to Ben Affleck's Batman. And then the trailer ends with the all-time greatest Spider-Man movie villain of all time, Alfred Molina's Dr. Octopus. Hello, Peter. Peter Parker. Brilliant, but lazy. And you'll recognize the woman Peter is talking to here, that's your mom. So that's what happens, but... What does it all mean, Basil? I'm sure we've all seen Into the Spider-Verse, arguably the best Spider-Man movie of all time. Tell me your rankings down in the comments and I'll tell you mine. So that movie did a great job of introducing superhero movie fans to the idea of a superhero multiverse. This concept has been around in the comics ever since Flash traveled to Earth 2 and Flash number 123, Flash of Two Worlds. And then, of course, Loki brought this concept into the MCU and even gave the multiverse characters a title, Variants. But sometimes people like you veer off the path the timekeepers created. We call those Variants. And now, Sony is taking this multiverse concept and using it to form their own live-action Spider-Man universe. So even though Spider-Man is in the MCU, Marvel still doesn't have the film rights. They agreed with Sony to share the character. Now back in the early 20-teens, Sony was trying to build their own interconnected universe of Spider-Man characters. That's why Amazing Spider-Man 2 is such a crowded film. It was trying to set up a Sinister Six movie. Since then, Sony has been rebuilding the brand and introducing us to the idea of a Spider-Verse. This is a way for them to consolidate all of their Spider-related properties into one universe. So Venom has the Daily Bugle logo from the Raimi films. Raimi Spider-Man graffiti appears in the Morbius trailer. The Vulture from the MCU meets Morbius, and now Tom Holland will meet the villains from the other Spider-Man movies. For years, Sony was developing this Sinister Six movie with Drew Goddard, who is great. He was the showrunner of Daredevil and co-wrote Cabin in the Woods. His IMDb page is popping. So by bringing Tom Holland into this multiverse, they can consolidate all of these spider stories and create their own cinematic universe separate from Marvel. This way, they can also claim that Venom is part of the MCU, because he's technically part of this Marvel multiverse. It all gets very weird and interconnected like the Tommyverse theory, which states that because of TV crossovers, 450 different TV series all exist as part of one shared universe in the dreams of a child. Google it, it's nuts. So when Sony and Marvel reached their most recent deal, Kevin Feige even said Spider-Man also happens to be the only hero with the superpower to cross cinematic universes. That quote was the beginning of the end for Spider-Man in the MCU. See, Sony Pictures is Disney's competition. They don't want to lend their characters to a Disney film. They want their own cinematic universe. They want Venom and Morbius and Kraven to become household names, just like Guardians of the Galaxy or Doctor Strange. So it's kind of a bummer, but I think this is the end of Spider-Man in the MCU. I don't want to go. I don't want to go, sir, please. But I do love the multiverse model of a cinematic universe. It's basically a way for fans to have whatever version of the characters we want. You like a darker story? You have Andrew. You like can't be fun? You have Toby. There are no wrong answers and we can just enjoy ourselves. But those are all the Easter eggs that I found. If you found any, let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.